Hello bio students. This lesson is going to be on chromosome mapping and I'm going to start off by just uh, taking a look at the two trait cross once again reminding you of a couple of things before we do go on to the chromosome mapping itself. Remember that with a two trait or a dihybrid cross those different genes, the two different genes, they do in fact have to be on separate chromosomes. So if we use just a simple example here of the A gene and the B gene and if we just say that the A gene is on one chromosome, the uh, shorter chromosome, and the B gene is on another chromosome, the longer chromosome. And remember that there are two of each chromosome in diploid cells and parent cells, so we can have another copy of this first chromosome, in this case with a different allele for this A gene, the lowercase a, and the same thing with the B gene on this chromosome, the lowercase allele. So keep in mind what does go on during the process of independent assortment, going back to meiosis, is whatever direction the first chromosomes go in, it has no influence whatsoever on the separation of the other chromosomes. So of course these chromosomes, they are going to duplicate, but I won't show the uh, duplication of these individual chromosomes. I'll just show the separation of them. So one possibility that we can have is that the capital A and capital B, the gene that does have, or the chromosome that does have the capital A gene and the one that has the capital B gene go in the same direction. So we would end up with some gametes that do have the capital A and the capital B. We could of course then also have the lowercase a and the lowercase b, those two chromosomes with those genes going in the opposite direction. So we would get a gamete that has a lowercase a and a lowercase b. But keep in mind that these are not the only possibilities because of independent assortment. So just because we have the capital A that is going to the left doesn't mean that the capital B has to go to the left. It could be the lowercase b. So we could also have a gamete that has the capital A allele and the lowercase b allele. And the final possibility then that we could have here is the lowercase a along with the capital B. So this is the case if these two genes, the A and the B gene, are on different chromosomes. So once again, these are the four different possible gamete genotypes that we could get. And if you were to set up a Punnett square and both parents are heterozygous for both of these genes, you would have to use all 16 squares in the Punnett square. And what we would end up with is a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. That is, again, if both parents are heterozygous for both genes and they are on separate chromosomes but of course there are thousands of different genes they can't all be on separate chromosomes what if they're on the same chromosome so if the A and B gene are on the same chromosome, then of course they are physically attached together on the same single strand. So in other words, wherever the capital A goes, it's going to drag along the capital B with it. And the same thing with our other chromosome that we have here with the two lowercase alleles. Those two are physically attached together and they will go in the same direction. So what we would then expect, because they are joined together on the same chromosome, is we wouldn't get all of those four different possible gamete genotypes that we saw if they're on separate chromosomes and that these are the only two that would then be possible. So if we were to set up a Punnett square, what we would see then is that we don't get quite as many possibilities in terms of the different uh, genotypes and in terms of the different phenotypes. So if we look at a real example and just say that that A gene that I've been referring to, it is a gene that is for the body color in the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. So the capital A being dominant, that's for the wild type, the type that you typically do see in a wild population. And the recessive version, the lowercase a, is for the black body color. And we'll say that the B gene is for the Drosophila wing shape, capital B dominant, that's for straight wings, and the lowercase b, the recessive version, for the curved wings. So now if we have both parents that are heterozygous, they would have this genotype, but again, we don't have quite as many possibilities and we wouldn't be able to use, or at least we wouldn't predict that we would be using all 16 squares of the Punnett square. So once again, from each one of these parents, because the A and B are physically attached 
and they are on the same chromosome. And if we assume that this is the case here, that it is the two capital letters that are together on one chromosome and the two lowercase letters that are together on the second chromosome, then this is what we would then predict in terms of our Punnett square. So from each parent, we're going to get this possible gamete genotype. We're going to get this possible gamete genotype. I'll put those ones along the top, exactly the same along the side, assuming that both parents are heterozygous and have the same sort of combination of the two capital letters on one chromosome and the two lowercase letters on the second chromosome. So now, remember our Punnett square is our prediction. So what would we then expect to get in the next generation? Well, you'd expect, based on probability, for one quarter of the offspring to be homozygous domin dominant for both of the genes. This one here, heterozygous for both of them. This one here, heterozygous for both of them as well. Now, keep in mind that all of these here, they all have at least one capital A and one a capital B. So what that means is that all of these ones here are going to be wild type and have the straight wings. So our prediction, wild type body color and straight wings, <clears throat> that's what we just saw here. The other possibility in our last square, predicting that one quarter of the offspring would have this particular genotype and the phenotype that goes along with it would be this one here, the black body color and the curved wings. So we don't see it in our Punnett square based upon the fact that the capital A and capital B are on the same chromosome, lowercase a and lowercase b on the same chromosome. So we wouldn't expect, it doesn't show it in our Punnett square, that we would have any fruit flies that have the wild type body color along with the curved wings, this genotype. And we also wouldn't expect to have the black body color and the straight wings this genotype here, it's not in our Punnett square. So that is what we would predict. And, well, this is what Thomas Hunt Morgan did in the early part of the 20th century. And what he found is that, well, those ones that we didn't actually predict would show up in the offspring, well, they did. They showed up in nine out of 300 of the Drosophila. So we did see that the A and B are physically attached on the same chromosome. So how is it possible that we can get some other genotypes in terms of the gametes? And well, what sort of ratio does this fit into? Does it fit into any of the ratios that we've come across in terms of our two trait crosses? Well, it doesn't. So where do these numbers actually come from? Well, going back once again to the process of meiosis, remember that even before we do have the lining up during metaphase one of meiosis and independent assortment, before that we do have crossing over. So crossing over does take place between the non-sister chromatids and that of course takes place during prophase one of meiosis. So in this case here, I will show the duplicated chromosomes. So prior to this crossing over, our first chromosome here, that I'll just shade in blue, we're going to duplicate it. And the duplicated ones, of course, they're going to be held together by the centromere. These are going to be identical. So we would have a capital A on this one and a capital B on the other sister chromatid. The other one I'll shade in red here. And same thing, we're using one to make the other, so they are going to be identical. Those ones held together, the two red ones. Once again, these sister chromatids for that particular chromosome, the lowercase a and the lowercase b. But something else, of course, does happen, and that is the crossing over. So if I just draw these again, so I am going to make the assumption here that, well, not all of them are crossing over. So this chromatid here on the outside, it's gonna remain the same with a capital A and a capital B. But the other one, what I'm gonna show is it's going to actually cross over with the other non-sister chromatid. Remember that crossing over is between the non-sister chromatids. And I'll do the same thing on the other side here. This one will remain the same as the original chromosome. But this one here, we're going to have the crossing over. 
So if we do have this crossing over that's taking place right here, at the end in the four different gametes that are produced, this is what we're going to get. We're going to get one of the chromosomes that looks just like the original one that we started with, with a capital A and a capital B. We're going to get another one that also looks like the original one with a lowercase a and a lowercase b, but we're also going to get these other ones which are a combination of them. So we're going to have this one with a capital A and a lowercase b, and the other one with the lowercase a and a capital B. So these two that look like the original ones that we started with in the first place, as we'll see for the purposes of chromosome mapping, we really don't care that much about these ones. They look like the original parent chromosomes, and for that reason, they are called the parentals. What we really care about are the ones that look a little bit different. They are the result of the crossing over, and this is what we call the recombinants. So we'll take a closer look at this in a couple of minutes, but the closer two genes are together on the same chromosome, the less likely there's going to be a crossover event, so the smaller the number of recombinants would be observed. So with Thomas Hunt Morgan, his 9 out of 300, that that's not a very large number of recombinants, so we would say that probably the A and the B gene, in this case the ones that were for the body color and the wing shape, were probably really cl relatively close together on the same chromosome. So how does this fit into making a chromosome map? Well, first of all, what is a chromosome map and what sort of information does it provide? So I have here uh, the title gene linkage. So what we're talking about is genes that are physically attached on the same chromosome. Zone. So we say that they are linked together and there is a greater likelihood than we would expect by, based on probability that they would be transmitted together and end up in the same gamete. And the mapping, we are going to make some chromosome maps. So I just have a map here showing um, a portion of Alberta anyway. So the area between or the region between Calgary and Edmonton. So with any kind of map, um, well, a few things that you probably want to know. So between the origin and the destination, you probably want to know a whole bunch of the different towns and cities that you're going to encounter along the way. So what are those towns? What is the order of those towns? And how far apart are they? So for example, how far is it from Calgary to Olds? What is that distance? What is the distance from Calgary to Red Deer? What is the distance from Red Deer to Innisfil. So all of these dif distances between all of the various different towns and cities along the way, that is the kind of information that you can get from a map. So a chromosome map, and this here is just showing chromosome 13, human chromosome number 13, there will be many, many more genes than the four that are identified on this particular map. But what this map even shows is that we do have these four different genes. And it shows the order of these genes, where they are along the length of the chromosome. And what we can also do, if we look really close at these numbers here, is we can tell what is the distance between these two genes, between these two, between these two, between every single pairs of the genes, what is the distance between them. So that is what is involved in making a chromosome map. What are the genes along the length of the chromosome? What is the order of them and how far apart are they? So as I mentioned, this linkage is referring to the greater than normal association between two traits, two genes, than would be expected by that process processes in, of independent assortment. Genes located on the same chromosome, that's what we're dealing with here, generally show this linkage and they are more likely to be transmitted together in the offspring than you would expect by independent assortment. But crossing over, of course, takes place during meiosis one, during prophase one of meiosis. And that's where we can get these different recombinants that do result where the chromosomes don't look like the original parental ones that we started with in the first place. So again, the parental ones do look like the original ones. It's these ones here that we really care about. They're the ones that are the result of the crossing over. So just to stress once again, that you're more likely to have recombinants and a higher percentage of recombinants if we're talking about genes 
genes that are far apart on the same chromosome. So I won't show these as uh, duplicated chromosomes. I'll just show one single one. So what this is going to be representing here is crossing over between the non-sister chromatids, where again we have the A gene and the B gene that are physically attached on the same chromosome. If they are far apart, it is simply more likely that there will be a crossover event, and that is due to the fact that, well, there is more space. There is more space for a crossover to occur. So we could have a crossover taking place here, it could be here, it could be anywhere in between, and we have a lot of space in between for a crossover to take place. So if I just draw, well, the same picture with two chromosomes only now, I put these same two genes, A and B, a little bit closer together, we're really just talking about the physical space. There is physically not as much space between these two genes now, so we don't have as much room for a crossover to take place. So because there is over here less space between the two genes, less likely to have a crossover event. So we would expect a fewer number of recombinants with this one on the right hand side compared to the A and B gene positions with the diagram on the left hand side. So now we can use those numbers, Thomas Hunt Morgan's numbers is what I'll take a look at to calculate the recombination frequency. So if we did do, do take a look at the number of recombinants that he came up with, it was nine. We're simply going to take that and divide it by 300. And that's going to give us the recombination frequency of 0 0.03. We can take this and we can multiply it by 100. And that's going to give us 3%. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to take this number and we're going to just convert it into, well, what are called map units. So a recombination frequency of 0 0.03 is 3%, and that is simply going to be three map units. So this is a fairly small number. So we would say that those two genes, again, are relatively close together on the same chromosome. So how do we use this to make a map? Well, whether it's the recombination number that you're given, the frequency or the percentage, we just take that and we convert it into map units. They may be whole numbers like is shown here. More than likely, there'll be a decimal in there as well, but we'll start with a fairly simple example. So here we have only three different genes. There is the A, the B, and the C gene. But is this their order on the chromosome? And how far apart? are these genes on the chromosome as well. That is what we are trying to find out. So let's take a look at a couple of strategies to for how to make a chromosome map. If you only have three genes, there are only a limited number of possibilities. The more genes, of course, the more complicated it's going to be. Usually the simplest thing to start with is take a look at the biggest number and take a look, are there two other numbers that add up to a third one? So we can see that the biggest number is 20 and 12 and eight add up to 20 as well. So the easiest thing to do usually to start with is to take the biggest number, draw your chromosome, your line representing your chromosome and put those two genes that have the largest number of map units between them at opposite ends of the chromosome. This doesn't always work, but it's a good place to start anyway. And now, if B and C are at the ends of the chromosomes, we would probably predict then that A would be somewhere in the middle. Doesn't always work out perfectly this way, but again, this is a good place to start. So we can then take a look at this information, and it says the distance from A to B is eight map units. So somewhere around here, we could stick in A, and we would say the distance between here and here is eight map units. And then we're also told the distance from A to C is 12 map units. Of course, the eight and the 12 do add up to the 20 map units. And this that map then does in fact work out. Some people like to draw this as a kind of a ruler as well. So we can draw our chromosome, something like this. And if we're saying that the total distance from one side to the other is 20 map units, I could put zero over here, 20, 10 right in the middle, 
five, 15, and these little ticks. And then we could simply say, oh, and by the way, we could completely flip it around the other way. So I could put my B over here. I could put my C over here. That would be perfectly fine as well. And then we know that the distance from A to C is 12 map units. So I would simply go over 12 and I would put my A here. And we can see that the distance again from here to here would then be the eight map units. So this is a fairly uh, simple map. So in some cases, they might just ask for the order. So you could write the order either as B, A, C, or as C, A, B. Either of them are exactly the same, and either of them would be correct. So we'll just quickly take a look at a couple of other ones here. Uh, this one I'll come back to because this one is maybe a little bit more difficult with four different genes. Uh, this one here, we do have a number of different genes on this one. And again, the easiest thing to look for is what is the biggest number? Well, let's take they, those two. Let's put them at the opposite ends of the chromosome and then sort of piece everything else together along the way. Doesn't always work, but again, this is a, usually a good place to start. So if we do take a look at that, from A to C is eight map units. So if this is a 12 somewhere in here, we could maybe put the eight about this location. That would be our C. C to D, 2%. Now for this one here, realize that it could be over in this direction or it could be over in this direction. So where exactly is D? Is D here or is D here? So now you need to take a look at some of the other information. A to F. So F, yeah, F could be over in this direction, but we're going to assume for now anyway that A and B are at the ends of the chromosome. From So A to F, uh, 16. So we could put it over in here somewhere for our F. F to B is 8. So that would sort of work here. Our eight map units from F to B, that all adds up. Uh, D to F is now six map units. So if D to A to F is our six, then we would have this space filled in here, which would be our six. And it would be a couple more over here. So that means that our D is probably in this position here. So the order for this one would be A, C, D, F, and B, or the other way around, B, F, D, C, and A. I won't draw all of, draw all of these, but uh, this is another one, and I think this one also works out if you do take the 11% and put them at the opposite ends of the chromosome. Take a look at some other ones that where two numbers add up to a third one. So for example, these ones here both add up to 11. So that might be kind of a clue as well that could help you out. So we, if we're saying that C and S are at the opposite ends of the chromosome, then that would put B right smack in the middle of that chromosome. So kind of look at that to uh, help you out and figure out the arrangement of the chromosome map and the distances between them. I did want to go back to this one because for this one here, as it turns out, when you take a look at the biggest number here, the 15 map units, and try and put it at the opposite ends of the chromosome, it doesn't quite work out that way. So again, other things to sort of look for. These two here, they do add up to 15. But if we take a look at one other thing, these two here, you'll notice that those add up to 21, and these two here also add up to 21. So when you actually set this up, as it turns out, the total length is going to be the 21 map units. And then you're piecing these four genes along this one. And again, in some cases, you do need to determine what is the distance between some of the genes that you may not be given the map distances for.